that these lectures are recorded, so you can review them at your leisure. But as you as you'll find, it's it's worth coming along because of the interactivity. If you have a question, if you have a comment, uh, I might even ask you a question um, once I get to know a few few faces and names. The unit that we're studying this semester is called Health of Individuals and Societies, NSG 1101. Um, I'm sure you've, you're familiar with the, the unit structure, where one is first year, first semester, 01, and there is 01, 02, 03, and 04. 01 is the theory unit, 02 is clinical specialty, 04 is professional studies and 03 is integrated clinical practice. They all go together. The, the ICP is what's called a capstone unit, which is where your um, placement is, is located. It's also where we do labs and simulations. Okay. Has somebody explained that course structure to you? Okay. There are course information books uh, that, are, that are coming out and, and, are, and are ready soon. Well. It should be working, but maybe not. Okay. okay, that's me. I'm here on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. So basically, whenever you've got a class uh, with me, uh, I'll be I'll be around. Days when you've got simulation. Uh, which I think are generally going to be a Friday. I'll be here those days as well. Best way to catch me is by email. Um, sometimes I can talk to you on the phone straight away. More often than not, I'll have, I'll have something else that I need to do. Um, so it's best to make an appointment. I uh, also have a Facebook profile specifically for work um, that I'm happy to connect on. If that if that's useful, and I and I do from time to time come across some some uh, you know, interesting readings, just to take that a little bit further. Okay, so today we're starting with health. Okay, you're in a nursing course where you're looking after, as I used to say to say to my kids, you're looking after sick nannies, but that's not where we start. To, to, to get an understanding of what nursing is about. We need to have an understanding of health and how that's different from illness. So the question of what is health is an important one for you to be able to answer. And those of you who have already been on Brightspace, who's been on Brightspace? Most of you? Uh, we'll have seen the first assessment task, which is a health beliefs reflection. Yes? Okay. Does that make any sense at all? That, 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 um, that assessment task so far? No, not, 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 not really? Okay. Um, reflecting on your beliefs about health is something you need to understand that concept very quickly because I think it's due at about week five. So, perspective is very important. What you think about something might be very different to what other people think about the same thing. Okay, you have two people looking at the same data, the two people coming along, there's a car accident in front of them. Typically, they'll give two different accounts of what happened. And they're both right and they're both wrong. It's not a matter of right or wrong, it's a matter of perspective. Okay? Hello. Just start charging. Okay. World Health Organization talks about health as being a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being. And this is the important bit, not merely the absence of disease or injury. So you don't have a diagnosed illness 
doesn't mean you're healthy. Okay, it might mean you're at risk. It might mean that you're not at your optimum level. It definitely means that your ability to understand and manage what you do and the environment in which you do it is really, really important. Okay. So following on from that, generally we see health as being able to do day to day what we want, what we want to be able to do. Okay, we're on the second floor. Who took the lift? Good. May this continue. The number of third years I see taking the lift to the second floor. I think we can see this. So health is an ability to function in the, in the way we want to. Now, obviously, as an Olympic athlete, your ability to function, your expectations about what your functioning level is going to be are different to if you're an 80-year-old pensioner with a walking frame. Okay, your days of the high jump are over. Similarly, um, somebody who's... 140 kilos and 45 years old is not ever likely to be a Bolshoi ballerina. No matter how much she wants to be. So it's not about, it's not just about mindset. Mindset is important. The way you think is important. But having an optimal level of health that reflects your ability to function. It's important. We're getting a lot of steak knives. And more. So here's another slight rewording of, um, of the who definition. Now, at the time, immediately post war, it was seen as quite a quite an innovative definition. <laughs> this word is seen to be a bit of a problem. What does complete mean? If you're missing a limb, or We'll put, it, we'll put it another way, and we will actually have a shoot on this later on in the semester. If you're in a wheelchair because of a spinal injury that has left you permanently disabled, can you consider yourself healthy ever? No? Yes. For that person, they can get to a point where they consider themselves healthy within their situation. Okay, so this, 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 this word complete is seen as problematic. So particularly when you've got chronic illnesses coming into play, oh, this isn't a habit, or is it just to do with the traffic? Uh, just getting used to it. Getting, getting used to it, that's it. Yeah, that, that, that's it. Yep. It's okay. So it's not just you, don't worry. There's been, there, there, there's been a regular so. And a quote from Huber, the, the requirement for complete health would leave us un, leave most of us unhealthy most of the time. Because if we're saying that it's an all or nothing situation, and somebody in a wheelchair can never be healthy, then how long have you got? How high do we want to raise the bar? So this, this word dynamic is important. Dynamic in this context simply means that it changes. 
It's a state of well-being where each person, as an individual, takes responsibility within their own context. So what is their age? What is their culture? What, is, what are the demands of their life? Okay. Most of us don't need to run a, to run a marathon every, every other day. Um, I'm, I'm a cycling fan and I'm, I'm regularly amazed by the sort of you know, 200k rides that these guys go on most days of the week. Um, I, I struggle to get out 80. It's, it's just, just phenomenal. But the demands that they put on themselves in their own individual circumstances allow them to do that. If you have a bit of time, you, you'll, you'll be able to think about individual circumstances that you are able to, to fulfil your own expectations and call yourself healthy as a result. Another focus of this unit is health promotion. And um, a big part of that is what's called the Ottawa Charter. You need to know the Ottawa Charter. Um, I need to be able to wake you up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Not that I ever would. Um, somebody should be able to do that. Um, and so what, what are the eight prerequisites of health under the Ottawa Charter? And these are those. Do any of those surprise you? What do you notice about them? About those prerequisites for health? They don't really define anything on like diseases. They're not about health, they're not about health or illness. Are they? They're just about living. So living in a peaceful environment, having housing, shelter. Those of you who have done previous study will recognise uh, Maslow in some of these. And we'll talk about Maslow until you're sick of it. Um, no. um, having, having a level of education. Even in, even in education, um, it, it, it's not universally acknowledged that health, that health is, a, is, a, uh, is an outcome. I should probably start with this side. I? Obviously having adequate nutrition. Poverty is a risk to health. We know that. doesn't mean poor people are, by definition, less healthy but there, is, there are risk factors involved. Having a state or ecosystem, sustainable resources, and a stable society. I suppose that last one is really talking about justice and equity. So they're all important factors that go together to provide the environment in which health is more possible. And we'll, we'll, we'll explore some circumstances where health is at risk by the environment, for example, or by problems with, uh, with, with income distribution, for example. We've talked about some of these things, questions to keep in mind. My wife works in palliative care. Um, she goes out and helps people die, have, have, have a, a good death. Who's heard of the concept of good death? Yep. What do you understand that to mean? Oh, yeah, you can do it. Yep. Yeah, being ready. Yeah. 
Um, who, who's uncomfortable with that concept? Anyone? Okay. If you've had treatment for cancer and you've gone into remission, do you keep, consider yourself healthy or could you consider yourself healthy in that type of situation? Sometimes. Similar to the wheelchair analogy. So the question arises, is it all just a state of mind? Some people consider themselves pretty much healthy most of the time and they have occasional hiccups along the road. Some people consider themselves chronically ill and occasionally they get well or, or less unwell. Some people consider it to be a lifestyle. Question for reflection, there's that word again. Remember your first assessment task. What does help mean to you personally? And where did you get your ideas from? That's the first part of the assignment. What do you think healthy is? Where did those ideas come from? The reasons why we need to understand what we're talking about when we're, when we're talking about health, um, most of our healthcare system is actually a, um, an illness care system. Despite the fact that it's, uh, I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, the spending is backwards to that. We spend much more on, on, on trying to cure things than we ever do trying to prevent them. Biggest health breakthrough in Western society ever? Who knows? What was the biggest health breakthrough? Preventative health breakthrough ever. Hmm? Immunisation, no, long, long before immunisation, before hand washing. The London sewers got rid of cholera in the city. Hmm. Hand washing was important, but it was a slow burn, it's, and it's really not very well done still to this day. You'll spend a lot of time, get good at hand washing because in second year they really come down on the hand washing. Um, little face. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Now arguably there's lip service paid to, health, um, to illness prevention and, and health promotion. Um, statement from the from the Australian government nearly ten years ago, and you could argue that um, that there's a little bit of lip service paid in, in in that if you look at the way the money's flowed before and since. But fundamentally, it's a true statement: the keeping people well and preventing disease is as important as managing and caring for sick people. Here is a socio-ecological model of health. So if we have people in the middle that, are, that have their health status influenced by individual factors, then individual lifestyle factors outside that, the networks in their society and community, and then some of the impacts that we talked about in relation to, to the Ottawa Charter that impact on the individual through the society and individual lifestyle. You might like, who likes running? Who, who likes to going for a run? If you lived in a war zone, you couldn't do that.
All right. um, if you were in a, an area that was prone to flooding, uh, you wouldn't maybe want to go too far from home uh, when it was raining because you might get flash flooded out of there. Um, there, there, were, there was rain on uh, Uluru in, back in January and people got caught by surprise. So I was going for a drive, one town to another, and, um, yeah, the road was cut and they couldn't get through. That was the risk to their health. Like, they got those people out. Okay, so that's one model of thinking about how these factors impact on individual health statuses. We talk a lot about, and in the tutor to, um, this, uh, this week, we'll talk about the social determinants of health and your beliefs about that. The conditions that we are born in, grow, live, work and age, some of them are predetermined. Okay, there's the whole nature-nurture debate about whether our circumstances are genetically determined or are dependent on our environment. Many of those determinants are what's called socially constructed. Who's familiar with that term? Anybody familiar with, with, with the idea of something being socially constructed? Okay, money, for example, is socially constructed. That is, it doesn't exist except that society says it does. Okay, can you imagine a society without money? No? Money is a human invention. Wouldn't exist if we hadn't invented it. So, time. And the passage of time, yes. But the fact that it was nine o'clock and you were late, that's a, that's a social construction. We made a contract to say that the, um, the lecture started at 8.30. And it is now... Sorry, I heard that. <laughs> um, some societies... My wife spent some time in, in Pacific Islands doing, doing some overseas aid work and um, she missed the plane one day and said, oh, it's all right, I'll do another one tomorrow. <laughs> never, never mind that she had a connecting flight that she had to make. That wasn't on, the, that wasn't on, their, on their radar. The, the, the attitude towards time that we have in Australia is, um, is, is I sometimes think, quite uniquely Western. Not everyone has um, an attitude towards time that's so rigidly controlled by the numbers on the dial. Okay. Um, we're all a bowl of spaghetti. Everything is connected. Um, there was, a, yeah, there was a show on Netflix the other, the other week called Dirt Gently. I don't know if anybody saw it. Um, it's still around, actually. Um, but the interplay between the, all of these factors can be very, very complex. Having a sense of control over your situation and environment when some of these things are seemingly flying out of control or not how you'd want them to be, um, can be really problematic for somebody's health status and health journey. It's good to see numbers. I was going to say that.
This is a good thing, right? Life expectancy over the last 50 years has gone up by 20 years in Australia. Back when the age pension was first thought of, there's another example of social construction. The age limit was, well, the starting age was set at 65. Do you know what was set there? Because the average life expectancy in the society at the time was 60. And they thought, oh yeah, th th these are for people who are really old. Now, th th they're wanting to push it out further and further and further, and it's 67 going to be 70 soon. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm ever expecting to, to actually be old enough. <laughs> Not that, I'm not sure I really want to. I know somebody is selling their house, selling one of their investment properties so they can still qualify for the pension. I'm thinking, really? I don't see the sense of that, but that's not a whole lot. You look at that combined with that, what we are seeing is a greater gap between poorer countries and less poor countries, the economic in inequity of that is screaming out. And there's been, there's been data late, lately about, I think it was the richest eight people in the world own more than the lower, than the bottom 50%, or something like that. Scary figure. You'll notice some um, Parallels to the auto charter, certainly with poverty, accommodation, availability of food, the political situation, and the approach that's taken to illness and healthcare, um, often characterised as either building fences at the top of cliffs or ambulances at the bottom. Okay, so you can see the difference. If, you, if you're building a, a fence at the top of a cliff, you're stopping people falling off. If you're building ambulances at the bottom, people are still going to fall off, but you can look after them. First one's prevention, second one's cure or treat. You see that difference? So there are major discrepancies between different parts of the world in terms of their health. I'm a psych nurse. And as a psych nurse, it doesn't really bother me. Well, it does. But it's a secondary concern what has caused a, a person's issues, what has brought them here. And my take on nursing is very much that the priority needs to be where to from here, okay? The situation that you're in is what it is. We can't change the past. But where do we go next? Where do we, where do we take your current situation from here? unpacking some of those, some of the social factors that influence health. Are there some groups looking at that constellation, that complexity that goes around? Are there some groups that are more likely to be homeless in a given society? Let's look, let me look at Melbourne. Are there some groups that are more likely to be homeless? Yeah, there's some nodding. Can I have a Bit of a bit of a sing out, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so drug users? Yeah. Yeah, alcoholics, smokers, maybe not so much. <laughs> Coffee drinkers? Smashed avo eaters. <laughs> not gonna get a mortgage because you eat smashed avo. I mean that was foot in mouth moment. Yeah, okay, so that's an example. 
um, think of a marginalised group. Think of a group that is socially marginalised. Yeah. Where have I met you before? I don't know. Your face is familiar. It was, you know. Ebony, hi. Let's see. Um. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. First Nation. Other ethnic groups, new arrivals, um, been in the news a lot lately, victims of domestic violence, more likely to be homeless. Be very careful of stereotypes when we're, when we're talking about health. And this is a good example. Um, the stereotype of a homeless person being an old guy with a with a bottle in his, in a in a brown paper bag um, does not stack up. Most, no, not most. The, your, your typical homeless person is nothing like that. Often young, often a single mum with kids. Sometimes a young person couch surfing is technically homeless. They have nowhere to call home. They have a bed for the night. They're not actually sleeping rough, but they're homeless. They've been thrown out of home. They've decided to leave. Circumstances are such that I knew a family who had a mortgage, decided to move and rebuild. The builder went bust. So, and so they were renting while their, house, while their new house was supposedly being built. Then their landlord decided that he needed to cancel the lease. They couldn't get back into the rental market. They couldn't get back into the housing market. They were on the streets two years after having their own mortgage. These things can happen. Does earning... Does your, does your economic circumstances affect your life expectancy? Ooh, that's, that's, uh, yeah, Interest, that's an interesting take. Yep. Can also get, um, say yes, given that medical now can still cost a lot of money, do you know what I mean? And so you can only afford so much. You're really sick. It still costs a lot to get sick. Yeah. Even in Australia, with Medicare, whole lot, there's a risk of the end of the project. It's getting more done and stuff. Um, if you run out of money, you can no longer keep getting that medicine. It's going to reduce your life expectancy. Whereas someone with money can keep paying. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think probably probably the best answer is it depends. Yeah. You know. Uh, and, and it's true of a lot of these things. It depends. Um, you, you've got to, you've got to drill down to what is the individual circumstance. So you can see why we've got this unit at the start of the course. Because next week, I think, we start talking about health assessment. And the flip side of that is identifying problems that need, that need to be addressed. Are there some groups that are more likely to use psychoactive substances? Flip side, are there some groups that are less likely to? Problem. We're not making moral judgments here. We're just stating the fact that in some groups, different ways of, of interacting, different ways of coping, different ways of recreating are going to be more prevalent than in others. Is there a correlation between nutrition and income equality? Oh, yeah. Hi. Very much so. Fruit and vegetables are expensive. We know fruit and vegetables are healthy, good for you. We also know that Convenience foods and fast foods are very effective in their marketing. 
to people who are time poor, maybe resource poor. A friend of mine went to Peru and taught the people up on the hill in a, in a desert environment outside Lima how to cook because they didn't have running water, they didn't have electricity. He was a chef. He went up there and helped them organise a kitchen. And they, knew, they knew how to cook, but they didn't know how to cook, if you see the difference. They didn't have, they didn't have the, the, the resources, um, the mindset to get beyond the immediacy of, oh, my God, got, we've got to eat tonight, to six months down the track, how, is, how have our dietary habits changed from what they were six months ago? Arguably a, a, a correlation between ethnic grouping and health. That word correlation is an interesting one. Um, if something is correlated, it means that there is a relation. Um, between two things. But there are things that, that John may mention to you, um, but if he doesn't, I certainly will, call, call spurious correlations. Because something is correlated, doesn't mean that the link between them is causal. Okay, so in my field of speciality, Cannabis use is correlated with schizophrenia. But the link being causal is far from clear. People that, yep. Is that like normal cannabis? Or <laughs> generally, head, generally head. High THC cannabis. I mean, the debate, on, the, the, the debate about medical cannabis um, <laughs> It has really been coloured with, with by, by people with um, with agendas that they're, that they're, they're not always acknowledging, um, because the issue is not about THC in relation to medical cannabis. It's about some of the other active constituents. Um, the, th the fact is that the correlation does not equal cause. That's, that's the take-home that, that, that I want you to get. So because something is related, and you'll see, you'll see it on the news. Whenever you hear the word correlation, be very careful because people often conflate that with one thing causes another thing. And that's not what correlation means. Oh, we've got animation in this one. Think about a culture different to your own. Think about the culture that you're in. Think about the way medical care is delivered in your culture and how health is defined in your culture. Now think about another culture. The way medical care is delivered and the way health is defined could be different. And this is the second part of your assignment not necessarily about culture, but there, are, there will be people who think about health and have beliefs about health that are different to yours. That's okay. May work in their circumstance better than your belief would work for them. The differences in medical care as well. There is also an influence from culture on the relative incidence of certain diseases and disorders. They've been struggling for a long time with HIV in Southern Africa because they don't believe that it can be sexually transmitted or 
haven't believed for, for a lot of years. They've struggled with that. You look so like one of the lecturers. Have you met Ophelia? No? <laughs> you look so like it. Okay, thinking, what's she doing in my class? <laughs> what's your name? Shami. Shami. Okay. Some perspectives from sociology on health and illness. There's the functionalist approach, which is about controlling the process of being sick so that not too many people are released from their societal responsibilities. What would happen if everybody got sick? There'd be nobody to do the work. And work is more important than health, isn't it? <laughs> That's a functionalist approach, okay? We all have functions. We are all functionaries. Uh, one of the things you'll learn in nursing is that none of you are expendable, inexpendable. You can all be replaced. Um, and you will, when you get jobs, you will probably be replacing somebody else who's left or retired or run out screaming. The functionalist approach um, emphasises the idea of the sick role. Who's heard of somebody being in a sick role? Being a patient, playing the part of a patient. A guy called Talcott Parsons was um, a sociologist who explored this in, uh, in some detail. He talked about the rights and obligations of the sick role. And you can see this in, in, in a healthcare environment, that a sick person is excused, they're given a day off. Yeah? Um, they're even paid to have a day off. They're exempt from normal social roles. They're seen as not responsible for what's happening to them. Okay, so if something is defined as a health issue, and coming back to, to the drug question, a lot of the pushback about defining substance abuse as a health issue is this. The people want to say that it's a health issue so people are not responsible for what's happening to them. And people on the other side are saying no. People make a choice. And it's not an easy debate to have. Sick people also have obligations. They should try to get well. What's the word that starts with M of a sick person who doesn't try to get well? Malingerer. We don't want to be a malingerer. Is that, is that a judgmental term or what? Yes, it's a judgmental term. But it's seen as an obligation of sick people that you want to get well. Why don't you want to get well? You want to stay sick? You want to stay dependent on, on your family and the healthcare system? How selfish is that? Sick people should seek com technically competent help and cooperate with the physician, i.e. doctor. Been a bit of pushback about that lately as well. To the extent that the new one, one of the new nursing standards talks about patients being the expert in their own lives, which is something that is, would have been unheard of 50 years ago. Another approach. In, in, in contrast to the functional approach, 
conflict approach essentially talks about medicine as a major institution of social control, medical industrial complex. In the same way that we have the military industrial complex, we have things being defined as medical conditions like grief. We have a pill for grief now. And people are saying, well, hang on, no. Grieving is a part of life. It's not, a, it's not an illness. It's not something we need to prevent or eradicate. Who's seen the movie The Pursuit of Happiness? Love that movie. One of the things about it is that it's about the pursuit. It's not about the thing itself. When is he happy? Right at the end. There's a book called The Happiness Trap that we might get to, we certainly get to it in second year. Where, where Russ Harris makes the point that our obsession with being happy is actually counterproductive. That if we set out to be happy and we do take lots of selfies um, and, we, and we promote our highlights, we're actually digging a bit of a hole for ourselves in terms of actually achieving what we're looking for so hard. And it's much more valuable to actually do things that have, have meaning, but that's another whole debate. Okay. The interactionist approach to health and illness looks at the, looks at the um, as it says, the interactions, the relationships between healthcare professionals, of which you, you guys are going to be some, and patients or clients or healthcare consumers. And it talks much more, in contrast to this one, about patients having an active role in decision-making about what happens to their health, what direction it goes in. We've talked about social construction earlier, it's a fundamental sociological term. The other, the other um, concept that I want you to get your head around is the idea of something being subjective and objective. What do I mean by that? Anybody, anybody come across that term before? No? Yes? What does subjective mean? Okay. The easiest way to think about it, subjective is something, it's inside, it's inside me. Okay? Only I know about it. Objective, anybody can see it. It's an object. Okay? This is an object. If I have a headache, that's subject. Okay? It, it's, it's subject to my own perceptions. Yeah? Is it like if you have a temperature of like, say, 36, when it passes something that's objective, that you can see that? Or would that be? Like, you know, it's true. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so taking the temperature, but having hot flushes. Be might be subjective because yeah. that might not be something okay obvious one in healthcare pain is pain objective or subjective subjective. it's subjective what's the implication of that if somebody tells you that they are in pain you believe them you don't have any evidence to the contrary sometimes you might but if they're adamant that they're in, that, 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 that they're in pain any sort of pain and that's important for my units. So labelling is a very risky process. Um, healthy and ill, and, and Ill are generally socially defined, socially constructed ideas. So we need to be very careful about using, using those labels in particular. And it's surprising how often our own preconceptions bubble up 
like I say, you'll have simulation later on this semester and all through the course. And um, the simulation scenarios are designed to bring you to the edge of your knowledge and skills and attitudes. And sometimes people tip over. And I've seen people say, oh, you should live a healthy lifestyle to the person role-playing in front of them or to the actor who's been the simulated patient. And it's very close to being pejorative or judgmental in those types of situations. Okay. Um, yeah, I've talked about grief. I'm sure you can think about other examples. Um, who's come straight out of school? Okay. Did, did you read about ADHD? Why are you all at the back? All the school leavers are at the back. Um, ADHD is, is one of those disorders that's not without its controversy because it wasn't all that long ago, you hardly ever saw it. There, there is debate around that it's actually a construction of pharmaceuticals so they can sell amphetamines to kids. And some of the arguments are hard to argue with. It's not that there are no problems, but yeah. Okay, now what's the problem with, 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 with that alternative? Okay. Okay, so if I say to you, no, your child doesn't have ADHD, you're just feeding them wrong. What, what, what's, what's, the, what's the problem with that approach? It's judgmental. It's taking agency off them. Is it that simple though? Oh. Yeah, I have too. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Look, I'm not. I'm not saying it's it, it's it's simple. There there are reasons why you guys are going to get paid the big big bucks. <laughs> um. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um. Yeah. Healthcare is complex. Patients are the experts in their own lives, but sometimes they don't know what they don't know. And information sharing, with, which we will go through um, in, the, in the communication section of this, of this unit um, when Liz comes in and runs that section, um, is not about shoving the information down people's throats, whether they want it or not. Very fraught talking about normal and abnormal. Very dangerous terms. It is the individual's social position and the norms in the society that determine who is called ill, diseased or disabled. That's what social construction means in relation to health. So if a society's norms change, if what is considered normal changes, then what is considered abnormal is also going to change. And that can vary over time and over distance different places. Once you have a label, it's quite difficult to lose it. If you have a label as an addict, or if you have a label as a diabetic, 
Well, if you have a label as somebody with a disability, then it can be really hard for, not only for society to think differently about you, but for you to think differently about yourself. And there are all sorts of implications of that for healthcare. I knew a guy who developed MS. He had been a psychonist. He got so angry, he was, you couldn't go near him. He was in a wheelchair, but he was the most assaultive guy I've ever met. He didn't live long. Um, so, some, some people with MS have, a, have a, uh, quite a long course of their illness. This was very quick. And, Sometimes I think mercifully because um, he was just not dealing with it. There are, there are possibilities at any point where a decision is made to redefine what we see as normal. And we've seen this um, very publicly uh, in, in, uh, in Western society over recent years in relation to sexuality. Okay, what, what is seen as normal has shifted quite markedly over the last 30, 40 years. So here's some examples of the impact of poverty, of economic hardship on infant mortality. In, 20, in 2004, okay, Sweden, 2.8 deaths per thousand live births. Sierra Leone, 180. That's not equitable. If everything else was equal, you would look at that and think there's something seriously wrong here. Trouble is we know everything else is not equal. So those, those four major approaches, just to sum up. Sorry. Those four major approaches, just to sum up, <laughs> functional, conflict, interactionist, and labeling. There's a school called Structural Functionism, which talks about the functions that are necessary in society. And looks at society itself as a collection of institutions. So you have the family, you have education, you have healthcare, you have the world of work. And in structural functionism, what we are looking for is some equilibrium between those. So we're not overemphasizing allegiance to the institutions. We're not just doing what makes us happy to the exclusion of other people around us. So if you have a stable system, you have a peaceful system that is marked by good governance, stable education and cultural system, the rule of law, so everybody knows what's okay and what's not okay. People don't, don't go around. I mean, I've been told in certain parts of Johannesburg, you did not stop at red lights. 
using a Bukaj act. Well, the rule of law has got problems, if, if that's the situation. Um, I know people in Melbourne who are quite surprised when they come to visit us, say, on a hot night we leave our front door open. They would never do that with ADIF because somebody might wander in and take something. You've been in that situation, no? <laughs> you never leave your door open? And it's, and it's self-evident. Of course not. Where I live, you don't know where I live. But where we live, we know the neighbours, roughly. We certainly know if... Eh? Sure, we don't leave them open where we live. Yeah. So we have we have ways of doing things. We have ways of doing things, and we can't, in a lot of cases, see why it shouldn't be that way. And in some cases, we can't imagine it being any other way. So the rule of law is very important and having sustainable development in all sorts of ways, particularly to do with the economic system. Now, if any one of those four fall over, then you can end up with a system, the stability of which is at risk. And that can create problems for people's health. Distinguishing between disease and illness. If we're talking about a disease, we're generally talking about something biological. The implication is that there's something medically defined going on. There's a bug or there's some homeostatic process that's gone awry somewhere. If we're talking about an illness, it's more of a lay concept. Sometimes it's defined medically, but sometimes we, we talk about illnesses as problematic experiences that may or may not have a biological origin. Medicalisation, we talked about earlier. <coughs> Health or behaviour conditions can be defined as medical issues, whereas they weren't before. I'm sure you can all think of examples of that. Happening in your own. Is anybody struggling to think of an example of that? One came up earlier, is the, is the, uh, the one about um, differences in sexuality. Okay, you look at um, or you look at an authoritarian culture, an authoritarian society where difference comes to be medicalised. Nazi Germany, they incarcerated the gypsies. They were seen to be an unhealthy race. Somebody being ritually unclean in ancient, um, in, in ancient cultures where, where being, you know, being ritually clean for the, for the ceremonies was seen to be really, really important. Certain events in everyday life can become medical issues and hence the doctor needs to be there. What's the obvious example? Come on. Most of you will, will undergo this at some point in your life 
if you haven't already. Childbirth. Is it a medical issue? Not necessarily. Does a doctor have to be there? Not necessarily. It's probably less risky if they are, but it's not by definition something that is a medical issue. It's not a disease. Medicalizing typically involves changes in social attitudes and terminology. And it's interesting, sometimes that word there is treatments precede the social attitudes and terminology. We have a treatment available and the, the attitudes and the terminology change to fit. And that's, that's the big concern that people have with ADHD, as an example. Was that there was a treatment and are we creating a disease to fit the treatment where there wasn't actually a disease to start with? It was something else. Needed attention, but maybe not medical attention. Maybe less processed food was the more appropriate treatment to giving people amphetamines. So the social production of health, Having an, having an emphasis on that involves shifting from the disease focus of medicine and a focus on medicine. Having the same emphasis on power, inequality, social relationships, organisation and structure. So those three elements get equal airtime. Acknowledging that social characteristics still play a dominant role, major role. Acknowledging that your occupation is related to your health. If you have a sedentary lifestyle, you're more likely to have back problems, for example. Acknowledging the position or uh, the importance of your social position of which those are four variables. Acknowledging the fact that disease and feelings of sickness are not determined solely by biological factors. That word correlation again. There's a correlation between the number of operations performed and how many surgeons there are in the area. This should not surprise anyone. But one doesn't cause the other, necessarily. You can argue that if there are a lot of surgeons around, then they are going to want to look for work and they're going to want to create a market. But that's getting close to conspiracy. I don't know that. Impacts of class, the environment you're living in, do you live under high tension wires or is there lead in the environment from you know, battery factories in the past, for example? What sort of housing do you live in? Are you in a high rise? Do you have open space around you? Do you live on a main road? You know there's lots of asbestos if you live in the main road? from the truck brakes. Hmm. They've, they've measured the, uh, the levels of asbestos in front yards of, um, of houses on main roads and they, they're through the roof um, because if there's trucks going on. Say a Warrigal Road, for example. Um, you wouldn't want to bring up kids because there are this trucks going along and whenever they break, the asbestos sort of flies around. Um, I can't remember what that word means. Don't worry about it. Um, gambling, alcoholism, learning disabilities. Okay, these are all terms that in one way or another come up through 
a societally constructed method? Good question. I've completely forgotten. Don't worry about it. The social need argument, what does that mean? It means that there is an argument that goes around that actually society needs sick people. It needs people who are on the outside. That if we belong, if you're in a club, by definition, there are other people who are not in the club and they are on the outside. And there's an argument that society needs people to look after. It needs people to be alienated. John Stuart Mill uh, wrote on utilitarianism, which is summarised as the greatest good for the greatest number. And that's been criticised due to the fact that if you follow through the argument, you are creating minorities. It's been going for a long time, utilitarianism, and you can see what's happening um, in the US and in the UK, where minorities that have felt, felt vo voiceless have suddenly found a voice. And the rest of society is sort of sitting up and wondering what happened. The way sickness is distributed in society, as we've said, is socially determined and is, and is related to the social relations between us. We've talked about those next three enough for now. The medical interventions we choose are determined by the social definition of sickness, so not actually what's going on with patients, but by the way society defines it. Medicine tries to split it up, ignoring power differentials, saying, all right, we'll treat each patient as an individual whereas it doesn't actually necessarily help very much. Okay, if you're, if you're, we've had patients who get discharged to what is colloquially known as a toxic environment. And we know when, they, when we discharge them that they will be back because they are not equipped to deal with the environment that they are going back to. So the medical approach to treating illness falls down in those type of situations. Um, it really points up the ideology that is behind you know, individualised medicine and the fact that there are hugely imbalanced power relationships with people who are seen as healers or seen as influential in a society. There are transitional times in a society when there's major changes. Okay, we, we saw, we've seen what's happened with HIV. We saw what happened with Zika virus, although it was, I think there's a bit of a storm in the teacup as far as Western society goes. But in terms of the people affected, that's pretty life-changing stuff. And degenerative changes, you know, the incidence of um, 
some arguably man-made diseases, um, a a asbestosis, for example. Um, but Western lifestyle diseases, things that might be due to processed foods, we'll talk about these a bit more tomorrow, some of the determinants of health. But these can change the way we think about what health and illness are. So that word expectancy, we expect somebody lives less than 70 years old, we think they haven't really lived very long. Whereas that, in a, in a nomadic situation, that's quite a long life. Senior administrators. If you go across each of these rows, the numbers go up as the status of the employee goes down. Sometimes quite, quite frighteningly, 6.5% versus 2%. And if, you, if you add all those causes together, 15% 15, 15 due to arguably preventable causes of death versus under five. So triple to change. Are males living longer or females living less long? Life expectancy is going up. I think men are catching up. Is that what that's saying? Or are they? I mean, 58.1 58 to 61.6 versus 75 to 80. That actually looks wider to me. Yeah, 3.5 to 5. Hmm. Yeah, so, so it, was, it was wider there. It's narrower now than it was, but it's still wider than it was way back. Now, what was happening in 1930? We had a depression. Economically, we were in the toilet. But we also didn't have McDonald's. <laughs> we, didn't have, we didn't have as many cars. We walked a lot. We rode horses. We did all sorts of things that we don't do now. Nearly as much. The ageing population, you've heard a lot about, I'm sure. 4% to 20.7% projected by 2050. So if you're in aged care, you won't be able to work anytime soon. Yeah, a lot of that's due to HIV. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, there's also some impact on, on war. Mind blowing comparing to our society with such an aging population yeah. and the average age years. And what, and what do we consider as normal? If we grow up in a situation like that, our, different, our, our ideas about normal are going to be completely different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, causes of death by age, now these are obviously American uh, numbers, but you can see some of the discrepancies. But some of them are interesting. I mean, blacks do pretty badly in all co all cause. Hispanics do pretty well, as do Islanders. Mm. 
you wouldn't want to get you wouldn't want you would not want to get sick in America. That's all. That's, that's all I would say. But their healthcare system, infant mortality by race as well. And that's over time. Just by race, nothing else. Controlled for everything else. There's been a shift from infectious to chronic diseases over time. To the extent where there's been some quite noticeable shifts. Those four on the red, five and in the red in 1900 are, are out of the top ten by 1998. and their place has been taken by, by chronic diseases that are arguably to do with lifestyle. Again, in developing countries, issues in the red on the right. Yeah. Respiratory infection seven point seven to three point seven. Still in the top four, top ten. Have you ever heard of anybody dying of diarrhea in Australia? Dysentery? It happens. Oh, it sometimes happens in Australia, but pretty rare. In other countries, 4.9 in 2000. Tuberculosis used to be a big killer in Western, Western countries, not anymore. And try and stay off the roads if you're in a developing country. So the epidemiological transition from infectious diseases to chronic diseases is well advanced in all but the poorest countries, but institutionally we still try to prevent disease and control it as if they were infectious diseases. Non-communicable disease, that means not infectious, okay? Arthritis is not infectious. Diabetes is not infectious. Hypertension is not infectious. <laughs> and we're not very good at preventing things from happening in the first place. We're not very good at building those fences. Not a very easy to read slide, but this is on Brightspace and the, um, the audio will be up at the end of today as well. Deaths per 100,000 in population. Um, in, again, in 1900, and in 1974. So, number one, influenza, IHD, later in the century. Some other demographic transitions that can affect health. We're having less kids than we used to. Maybe in an urban environment we don't need as many because we don't need as many kids to work on the farm because we're not on farms. Decreased mortality, infant mortality, increased life expectancies, 
there are there are change there have been changes to social and economic patterns that have influenced that um, people moving into cities hugely um, notable one changes in health conditions some some better some worse and changes in the way that we way that we deliver healthcare technology involved. Um, yeah, what we know, I mean, things like hand washing is a good example of that, yeah. Um, I think we're much more sedentary than we used to be. That's probably the biggest one. Yeah. Um, but, when, but at the same time, we're, we're a lot more aware of... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now... Knowledge is, is only power if you use it. So. No numbers on this one, but it's a typical chart. And in, your, in, um, in, in McMurray, there's, um, there's similar pieces about how many people of a given age, male or female, there are in a society. So in a developing country, you know, people grow, grow, grow. This might be, say, 20. This, these might be five-year increments, say. And then it just tapers off. In a developed country, there's a bulge in middle age, societally and otherwise. And there's reasons for that. And they're complex. Here's the projected population in Australia in 2041 compared to what the projection was in 1997, which is not very long ago. And you can see here the ageing population are, are bulge. I mean, the, the number of people 80 to 84 there's an increase in every, a massive increase in every uh, age over over about 50 for both genders. So again, we're going to age again. <laughs> Some of the human determinants of transitions, technological change. Telemedicine. You can be diagnosed. You can, some, in some cases, have keyhole surgery without the by, by a surgeon who's on another side of the planet. Alterations in the environment we've talked about. The type, availability, production, preparation, and consumption of food. If we had time, I'd show you um, some st some data about the nutritional content of, of food and how that's deteriorated with factory farming over the years. Difference or changes to patterns of energy, of energy expenditure. Uh, like I say, we used to just walk because we had to walk to get to places. Now we get in the car and go down and buy a bottle of milk. Yeah? Just the sort of incidental energy expenditure is, is, is uh, very much changed from older days. Um, and the way environmental factors and the gene pool in the community interact. We'll talk about that as we go through a bit as well. Social forces and processes embodied as biological events. The importance of considering and being aware of and paying attention to the impact of inequality in society. The well-off people do live longer. 
not necessarily because they're healthier, because, but because they've got the resources to be kept alive. A little bit to finish off on the socio, social e epidemiology of health. So social epidemiology is the study of distribution of, of disease, impairment, <coughs> and general health status. Incidence is how many cases are, ha are happening over a given period, and prevalence is how much there is at a given time. Morbidity is how many people are sick. Mortality is how many people are dying. I need to, I need to wind up. Yeah, no, no, no. I had Bob at the start. That seems to go without saying, but should it? and equity. So I think sums it up nicely. Okay. See you tomorrow. We'll talk more about the social determinants of health.